Sunday. And uh, this may be the first time that you've had an opportunity to worship with us. And we always want to make a special notice of those that are here for the first time so that we can make sure that you feel welcome. So if this is your first time to have worshiped with us, would you simply raise your hand and be giving a little um, sticker there so that uh, people can identify you? And, of course, you want to be sure, Holden Beach people, that when you see the yellow sticker, make sure that people know that they're welcome. We want them to feel like they have indeed come home. It's great to see you. Uh, by way of announcements, let me remind you that Wednesday night it will be our, our fellowship meal here at the chapel. So the um, form to, to fill out is in your bulletin. Please take a, a, note, a, a moment to fill that out so that we can prepare for your attendance. Um, it's going to be a wonderful time, and we look forward to uh, seeing you there. And also, the uh, women's retreat for April the 20th, the brochures, the registration brochures are in the, in the fellowship hall. Uh, entrance and I that say in the narthex be sure that you pitch, pick one up fill it out and uh, so that it'll be ready and that promises also to be a wonderful study with a uh, writer de Porras leading that it'll be a wonderful time make note of all the announcements in which you may be involved in the bulletin for the meetings and the opportunities so that uh, we can come together thank you for all that you do here in the chapel and now if you would look in your bulletin as we read responsibly our call to worship your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to observe with righteous ordinances. Accept my offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. Your decrees are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. May we pray together, please. Teach us, Lord, the ever-present need of gathering together to worship as a community of faith. Keep before us this vision of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is always mindful of the need to spend time in communion and in prayer with you. May that vision inspire us as members of your church to maintain the joy of our witness in worship and in love. Amen. And now would you get a hymnal and turn to hymn number 339. As we stand and sing together, I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. Please stand as we sing.
the back cover of your hymnal, you will find the Apostles' Creed. May we recite it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now would you take just a minute and greet those that are around you and to make a new friend if you don't already know them. <laughs> verses 1 through 3, and you may find it in your pew Bible on page 1056. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, Listen to me and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. Please join me in prayer. Father, we pray for an awareness of your presence with us as we make the Lenten journey with Jesus to the cross. We have done so little to deserve your mercy and love. We have done things we ought not to have done and left undone things we ought to have done. We pray as we make this journey of faith that we may unload the things and thoughts that hinder us. We remember how the Bible teaches us that you forget our confessed sins and remember them against us no more, that our sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. Help us to set aside what you have set aside, and walk with us through this Lenten journey of faith. For we pray as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you get a hymnal and turn to hymn number 354 as we once again stand and sing together, Praise Him, Praise Him. Please stand.
Heavenly Father, the one upon whom we depend for our everyday necessities, teach us how to use the blessings we have received for the greater good. And Lord, for any selfish traits that we may harbor, we pray that you would help us to turn them loose so that we may discover the true richness of life. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
happy to welcome back to the pulpit here at Holden Beach Chapel, Reverend Keith Benz. Keith is actually a North Carolina boy. He, I think he grew up in Raleigh. Or in the, in, did you grow up in Raleigh? I'm from Arizona. My wife's from Raleigh. Well, close. <laughs> close. He's almost a North Carolina boy. He grew up in Arizona. So his wife is from, uh, from North Carolina. So I, got, I can tell you, that makes him from North Carolina. But at any rate, um, uh, he served over in uh, Henderson, North Carolina, and he has uh, just a ton of uh, degrees. He worked in the, in the private sector for many years before going into the ministry. But um, he is now at, uh, in the Versailles uh, the Presbyterian Church, Versailles, Ken uh, Kentucky. And his wife, Cheryl, is a music therapist, recently retired as the clinical coordinator for creative arts therapy for the University of Kentucky Healthcare. Uh, it's wonderful to have uh, Keith and his wife, uh, Cheryl, here with us. Well, thank you. Yes, I consider myself a naturalized North Carolinian. <laughs> it's always an honor and a privilege to preach the Word of God, and I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. We look forward to our time here every year, and we're grateful to Reggie and to all of you for your hospitality and your graciousness. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John. Please listen for the word of God. Jesus left Judea and started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. 
So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this well will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one that you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ, and when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then the disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, why do you what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One Sunday during worship, I was really getting into my sermon. And I looked up and I saw a young man standing at the door in the back. His head was shaved. He was wearing a leather jacket and old, dirty jeans. He had chains around his neck, and he was covered in head to toe with tattoos and piercings. To be honest, it startled me. But being the consummate professional that I am, I just continued to go right on preaching. A few minutes later, I looked up, and he was gone. After the service, one of the ushers came up to me and said there was a man in the narthex who wanted to talk with me, and he described the man, and I was certain it was the man that I had seen earlier during the service. To be honest, I was a little annoyed. I knew all he wanted was money. I didn't have any money to give him, and I had to get to a restaurant before the Baptist got there to <laughs> join some of my friends for lunch. But I'm a minister, so I took a deep breath, and I went to talk to him. As I approached the man, I saw that he had the word hate tattooed on his neck, which just simply reinforced my initial impression. In a voice that I hoped would be welcoming, but was probably far more condescending, I said, what can I do for you? 
And of course, the unspoken words that were going through my head were, make it quick, I don't have anything to give you, and I need to get out of here, I have places to be. As he started to talk, tears formed in his eyes, and he said that his girlfriend was pregnant and they had been evicted from their apartment. They were living with his girlfriend's mother, but her mother didn't like him. And she said as long as he left, her daughter could stay there, but if he stayed, they were both out on the street. His girlfriend was sick, and he was concerned for her and the baby, so he left, and he was now homeless and had no place to go. He asked if I would pray with him, and of course, we sat and we prayed together, and he never asked me for another thing, only that I pray for him, and then he left. Embarrassed and ashamed, do not even begin to tell you how badly I felt that morning. I realized that I had a lot to learn, and I needed to make some real changes in my attitude. Jesus had come to me and asked me for a drink of water, and I didn't even recognize him. How often in our lives do we come to the face-to-face with Jesus in the faces of others and do not recognize him? How often has Jesus come to us in the faces of others and we were too busy or too worried about our own problems to offer a drink of water? Jesus was traveling with his disciples back to Galilee and they decided to go through Samaria. And as they were walking, Jesus got thirsty, so he stopped by a well, and he sends his disciples into town to get some food. It's in the middle of the day, and a Samaritan woman comes to the well to get water. Jesus realized he couldn't get water from the well without some help, so he asks her for a drink. Well, this woman's a little confused. She says, why are you a Jewish man talking to me, a Samaritan woman. You see, Jews and Samaritans have hated each other for centuries over differences in how they worship God. It was bad enough that a Jew was talking to a Samaritan, but in that culture, women didn't speak to men in public. This is a woman from a hated race of people who is so insignificant, she doesn't even have a name, and yet Jesus not only stops to talk to her, But he lets her do most of the talking, and he listens to what she says. You see, Jesus does a lot of talking in the Gospel of John. One of my favorite New Testament professors often refers to Jesus in this Gospel as, wordy is the lamb. (laughs) This is the longest conversation that Jesus has with anyone in the Bible. And it's with a hated, insignificant Samaritan woman, and he lets her do all the talking. And what's even more interesting is that Jesus asks her for help. You see, he's used to everybody coming to him and asking him for help. They want to be healed. They want something from him. But now he's the one that needs help, and he asks her. So now she's even a little more confused. Not only about the Jewish Samaritan woman man thing, but he keeps talking about living water. This living water that would keep her from ever having come to come to this well again. <laughs> And from what we know about this well, it took a lot of work to get water out of this well, so she would have been perfectly happy to never have to come back here again. So she wants to hear more about this living water. But you see, Jesus isn't talking about water. He's trying to help her understand who he is. She says she knows about the promised Messiah, but hasn't quite made the connection with Jesus. So Jesus gives her a little help. He asks her to go and get her husband. However, she's had five husbands, and the man she's currently living with is not her husband. Jesus knows all of this, but he's not saying it to embarrass her or to judge her. In fact, her past history is of absolutely no concern to him whatsoever. It's not the subject of the conversation. This conversation is about Jesus. Over the century, we Christians have made a lot of assumptions about this woman based on what Jesus says. Many have just assumed that she's a hussy who moves from man to man, and now she's living in sin with a man who she's not married to. However, in that culture, 
A woman needed a man to provide and to protect her. Women were simply property of their husband. In fact, religious law required that if a man dies, that his brother married his wife so that she would be cared for. And a man could easily divorce a woman in this culture without any reason at all, and she had no say in the matter. Now, certainly that is not at all considered appropriate in our culture today, and we cannot enforce our cultural biases on something that was written centuries ago. This woman may have been the victim of death or divorce or abuse or all of the above. The man she's currently living with may simply be someone who's caring for her. It's easy for us to make assumptions based on our current beliefs and miss the point of this story completely. Jesus is not the least bit worried about or even cares about any of this. He never says another word about it. The purpose of bringing it all up is so that she will see him as a prophet, and through her, others will believe. Jesus is the subject of this conversation, not the woman or her past. She's so amazed that he knows all of this. Notice she's amazed. She's not ashamed. She's amazed at all of this, that she leaves her water jar and she runs back into the village and tells everyone she can find about Jesus. Come and see a man who's told me everything I've ever done. He can't be the Messiah, can he? She screams. She's not sure we can still hear the doubt in her voice. Come and see is what she says to them. Come and see a man who's known everything I've ever done. Come and see our important words in this gospel. At the very beginning, the first words that Jesus speaks is when the disciples of John the Baptist come to Jesus and Jesus asks what they want. They tell him and he responds, come and see. Come and see is an invitation to discipleship. This woman is inviting others to come and follow Jesus. Because of what she says, many, many Samaritans came from that city to hear Jesus. They were so excited that they asked him to stay for a few days. They listened and learned from him, and they believed that he was truly the Messiah. Not because of what this woman told them, but because of what he taught them. This woman was a nobody. She was a woman who was so insignificant she doesn't have a name. She was a hated Samaritan. She may have been an outsider or even an outcast in her own society. And none of this may have even been her own fault. She was a nobody and yet through a simple drink of water. Because she listened, many others came to faith in Jesus and Jesus' ministry began to spread throughout the world. He asks her for a drink, and because she is willing to have this conversation with her, with him, her life was changed, and she brought others to faith in Jesus. Even in her doubt, she went out and invited others to be disciples. And who knows, maybe because of this conversation, the healing between the Jews and the Samaritans had begun. Who are the nobodies in our society? Who are the nobodies in our own community? Maybe sometimes you feel like a nobody. Jesus comes to us through the nobodies, asking for a simple drink of water. I can tell you hundreds of stories from my years in ministry and even before about how I've seen the face of Jesus in someone who was just a nobody. I've seen a homeless man who was offered a bed in a shelter, and he was so grateful for the kindness that he was shown that he changed his life around, and he's now the director of that shelter trying to help others like him. I've met people who were starving, and because of the kindness of others, turned their lives around and now use everything they have to make sure that others never go hungry. I've seen the face of Jesus in people who I didn't want to have anything to do with or didn't have the time to be bothered with, and yet they've changed my life forever. A simple act of kindness 
taking a few moments to talk with someone, pointing them to a place where they can get some help, donating some warm clothing or even a bar of soap, offering them a drink of water might just bring you face to face with Jesus and change your life forever. Lent is a time of introspection, a time of looking deep within our own hearts to examine who we are and what we believe. And as you take this time to look into your own hearts, I encourage you to think about how Jesus has appeared in your life. Maybe in a time of pain or a time of incredible joy, or maybe in the face of a stranger asking for a cup of water. Think about how you've responded. Were you too busy to be bothered? Or did you go out and proclaim your faith in words or actions, bringing others to see Christ in their lives? We see the face of Jesus in those around us, in the faces of those who look and talk differently than us, in the faces of those who have a different way of living than us, in the faces of those who we don't like and don't even want to be bothered with. But Jesus comes to us asking for our help, for a little drink of water. That drink of water can be the living water that changes the lives of others and maybe even change your life forever. To God be the glory now and forevermore. Amen. We are reminded of God's love and grace poured out to us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is at this table, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we are joined together in holy communion with one another and lifted up to be in holy communion with the living and risen Christ. Everyone is welcome at this table. So let us come together this morning and enjoy in thanksgiving, enjoy this feast that God has offered us today. Let us pray. With gratitude, O God, we lift up our voices in praise for all the blessings that you've given to us. You created this amazingly diverse world full of beauty beyond anything we can imagine. You created all people, women and men of all races, and gave this world to us so that we can enjoy your blessings. When we were stubborn people, you gave us your word and even sent us prophets to remind us that you are our God, but we didn't listen. When we got greedy and selfish and turned from your word, you came to live among us to show us your love, and to teach us how to love one another. We had turned so inward that we rejected you and crucified your son who you sent to show us your love. But because of your love for us, you showed infinite grace and raised us to live in glory with you. You could have rejected us, but instead you gave us new life. So we gather around this table As we gather around this table, we become one with each other and with Christians throughout the world, united in your love for us and our love for one another. When we share this feast, we acknowledge and celebrate your love for us, but we also remember those who are suffering, victims of oppression, injustice, anger, and hatred. We cannot eat this bread and forget those who are hungry. We cannot drink from this cup And forget those who are thirsty. We cannot hear your words of peace and forget that our world is at war. We cannot celebrate the feast of Holy Communion and forget our divisions. For us you were born. For us you healed, preached, taught, and showed us the way to God's glory. For us you were crucified. And for us you were raised from the dead in Christ. And he is now that bread of life. Gracious God, 
By your spirit, make us strong that we may share your love with your blessed and broken world. Feed us at this table, O God, that we may become more loving and giving people. Help us to love you above all else and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, demonstrating that love in all that we do and say. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed and arrested, he was having dinner with his friends, and he took bread and he blessed it, and he broke it. And he gave it to his friends saying, this is my body that's been given for you. Whenever you eat this bread, always remember me. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup. And he gave it to his friend saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins for all people. Whenever you drink from this cup, always remember me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we remember and praise Jesus for the love and grace that God has given to us until he comes again to sit with us in glory. Friends, everything has been prepared. Let us now join together and share in this feast.
This is the bread of life. Take and eat. The cup of salvation. Take and drink. Let us pray. Oh God, send us out from this table to answer Christ's summons into new life and to follow him with joy and gladness. Set our feet in his holy way that our lives may be signs of his life and all we do may show forth his love. Amen. Let us stand as we sing together our closing hymn, number 466. Remember that Jesus appears to us in the faces of others and is always with us in our hearts. And now may the love of God surround you and keep you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ guide you and give you strength. And the fire of the Holy Spirit burn deep within your souls. And the blessings of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>